Okay, so most of you know what the NSA is. Um, so they they are uh, uh, a U.S. agency in charge with uh, listening to us and spying on us and so on. And they have a, a, a very long history. And one of the things they have is a journal. It's called Cryptographic Spectrum. And they publish it once in a while. It has all sorts of uh, interesting things to the uh, NSA community. And of course, this, this document is completely classified. But... Somebody heard that it exists. So uh, there is a, a lawyer living in uh, in the United States called Michael Ravnitsky. And he um, sent what is called the Freedom of Information Act request. So this is a legal process where you can ask the United States government to publish, to give you a, a document that they produced. It's called the Chofesh and he wrote, and so on. Um, so... Um, he sent uh, a Freedom of Information request in 2003 uh, for the table of contents of all the uh, versions of uh, all the editions of cryptographic spectrum, which was really clever of him. And the NSA sat on this for four years. And then uh, I think four years or, or uh, two years, something like that. And then they published, uh, they couldn't find the table of contents, they published the index of cryptographic spectrum. And then what does uh, what does the next thing you do is um, uh, they did uh, what is called the breast BFS. So if you find an interesting article, you you do a Freedom of Information Act request for this. And, and a lot of interesting documents from the cryptographic spectrum came out and they are now uh, in the public domain. And one of them is a fascinating uh, article uh, from the 70s, uh, which some of you have might have read, and it's called Tempest, a single problem. And, and okay, so this is, uh, this is how this document came to be. And let's talk about what is written in this document. So this document tells a story about uh, World War II. Now, World War II uh, wasn't uh, the best time uh, for humanity, but still uh, a lot of uh, things, uh, important inventions came online in World War II. So for example, antibiotics, and uh, radar and um, flight, like really big time flight. And one of the things that came online was the wireless digital communications. So you could send digital messages from one side of the world to the other. And um, uh, the various armies of the world use it. So the US Army uh, had this digital wireless communication system on, and they wanted to send the signal from one side of the world uh, to the other, but they were very worried. So what were they worried about? Can anybody say in chat? Uh, what happens if you transmit a very powerful signal uh, using wireless communication? Yeah, of course, interception. Uh, yeah, everyone can hear it. So everybody else can set up uh, a receiver and find out what you are saying. So uh, what do you do? What is the, the basic thing you should do to your signal before you transmit it? What do you do? You scramble it, or you encrypt it very well. Um, uh, yes, you can encrypt the signal. Very good. So, um, what is encryption? Encryption, very basically, is a, it's a box. It's it's a machine uh, that gets as input the plain text and and also the key. Right? There's a secret key, and then it does no 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 does some kind of tricks, and outside comes the cipher text. And the ciphertext is uh, unclassified. You can transmit it to the entire world. And nobody can find, can if you build it right, of course, nobody can uh, decipher uh, the ciphertext and find out the plain text without the key. So um, we are in the uh, 1940s. So you don't have a lot of powerful computing power and you still need a really good encryptor. So what did the uh, US Army use for the cipher? The cipher is the encryption algorithm. Um, so let, let me, before I, do that, before I do that, I want to show you the encryption machine. The encryption machine is, is this box. Uh, it's made by Bell. And it's called the uh, AN something of the other. Some kind of machine, yeah. Don't remember the code exactly. It's I think it's AN1B1BQ, something like that. So uh, this machine uh, from, let's get the pointer going. Uh, it's going to be this. 
So there is a, a punch, a tape uh, with the plaintiffs coming in into one side of this machine. And there is a tape with the key, again, a piece, a piece of yellow paper coming into the other. And then it does the encryption. And outside comes another tape with the ciphertext. OK? So and then you take this tape with the ciphertext and you, you feed it into uh, you feed it into the transmitter, and on the other side, you have the entire setup all over again. Okay, so um, let's talk about some basic cryptographic stuff before we go into what this machine does and how it was broken. So let's assume I have an algorithm uh, which gets the key and the plaintext. It's called the encryption algorithm, okay? So outside, uh, comes, uh, I have a, a, a key coming in and a plaintiff coming in, and outside comes the ciphertext. Um, what's stopping me from looking at the ciphertext and, I mean, thinking, doing some statistics and figuring out what was the key? Any idea? What's, what's stopping me? Okay, the, the algorithm, okay, fine. Uh, and nothing, probably there is something which is stopping me. Um, so basically these, these encryption algorithms, if they're designed well, they take the key and they take the playtext and they mix them, they mix them really well. They make all the bits a function of each other and, and reversing this function is very, very hard. Um, okay, but let's still assume that we were still in the 1940s and you can't really build a really good mixing function. So I'm an attacker, and I um, I have the cipher text. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a cipher text, uh, and um, I don't know the plain text, and I want to find out what is the plain text. Um, so let's assume I know exactly how this algorithm works. Why is it fair for me to say that? Do you know why? Okay, I might have stolen an encryption machine. That's, that's a nice idea. Uh, so there is, a, there is a very famous, um, yeah, very good. There is a, yes, very, very good, very good. Thank you. There's a very famous uh, treatise written by August Kelhoffs, who is a Dutch crypto cryptographer and linguist who uh, lived in the, in the late 19th century. Uh, La Cryptographie Militaire, he published it in 1883. Uh, and uh, basically he said like there are a series of things that you need to have in the good crypto system. And the most famous one, which, which became Kelhoffs' principle is that you can give the adversary the plans to your machine and if you don't tell them the secret key, there you are still completely secure. So indeed, you can go. You could have gone in the 19, I don't know, 1940s, to the Bell Company's catalog, and you would be able to buy one of these machines for your house, or for your car, or for your horse. I don't know uh, why you wanted to do that, but these are completely uh, public. Uh, you you could buy them for yourself, and the complete the only secret is the key. So, um, so now I have the machine. I know it's design. I have a cipher text, uh, but I don't know what the plain text is. So, what can I do? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, I can. Okay, I can. Yeah, thank you. You're very excited. I'm excited together with you. Uh, you can brute force the key. Uh, if, if the guest users, I'm, I'm really apologizing for this miss feature of Big Blue Button. Can you like say your name? Because I don't know what it is. It's the, not identifying it. Uh, who said brute force the key? Dima. Okay, thank you, Dima. Uh, you can brute force the key. Uh, so what does that mean? You uh, take this machine and you build a copy of it or you buy it and then you try uh, key number one, you get an output. You have candidate plaintext number one, key number two, key number three. Okay, now you get a lot of plaintext. Okay, so what do you do now?
I have a lot of plain text. Which, how do I know which one is correct? Okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, I have a lot of suggestions here. So, so basically the idea is that uh, you have a lot of uh, plain text, but you don't have the entire space of all possible inputs as your plain text. So we have, let's, let's, let's take, for example, I have a one megabyte executable file. And who knows what are the first two bytes of an executable file? Very good, thank you, there, MZ. Oh, come on. Uh, and um, so uh, I have, um, well, let's say I have this usable file and uh, I encrypt it using uh, 256 uh, bit AES keys, key. That's like the top, the most, the best level of AES that exists. Now I have uh, a one megabyte cipher text and I want to find out which one is the right key. So I decrypt it uh, once, and I have many candidate decryptions. How many possible plain texts do I get if I try all of the keys? Yeah, I have exactly two to the power of 256. I have two to the power of 256 possible uh, plain texts. How many possible files of size one megabyte are there? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so there are, no, there are actually two to the power of eight mega. Okay, so if you say that M is, so there are actually two to the power of eight million possible one megabyte files. Uh, so the odds that you will have two plain texts, which are valid executables or valid um, messages about the weather or valid love letters or so on are very low. So if I go back to Shimon's comment earlier, you do statistics, you do linguistics, you say, okay, um, if I have a naval broadcast, probably there's something about the weather or the wind or it's going to look like English, the histograms, the more common letters and so on. Uh, and there is the famous Lorentz cipher, which was broken uh, using uh, the bomb. A bomb was a brute forcing machine, basically. I don't want to go into it right now. Uh, and um, thank you. Thank you for these very big numbers. Uh, this is the numbers you should give me in the course evaluation. Uh, so, uh, so you, you could assume that in the year uh, 1940, you didn't have a lot of uh, powerful encryption algorithms. Uh, so the decryption would be very fast and brute forcing would be a very, uh, very effective mechanism. But these are really, really secret messages. You really don't want them to get uh, leaked. So there is one cipher invented in 1919 by uh, an American inventor called uh, Gilbert Vernum, which is totally, uh, totally uh, invulnerable to brute force. Uh, and this, uh, does anybody know about the cipher? What is the cipher? Thank you, it's the one-time pad, also known as the Vernum cipher. So what is the one-time pad? You take a key, which is the size of the plaintext and you sum them together and you can sum them over whatever algebra you want. So Vernon was using alphabets, so we did alphabet. Usually we're going to think about binary, so you can XOR the plain text with the key and get the cipher text. So why is this invulnerable to brute force? The reason is, the answer is that the space of possible cipher text is exactly the space of possible messages. And uh, which means that whatever I want to see in the plain text, I will be possible to see. So if I get the message, uh, I can uh, say, okay, if I want the plain text to be, uh, take all your forces and march east, then there is a key for that. If I want to say, take all your forces and march west, there is a key for that. If you're, the message is, uh, happy birthday to you, there's also a message for that. So um, it's impossible to brute force. And this is, uh, 
still even you have a quantum computer and whatever you want you cannot you're not yeah if you use the same key twice then uh, uh and then you're in russia they hang you and i'm not going to go into that but don't do that yeah um yeah so 